I'm Stilla Webb. And I'm Siobhan Ghosh. I'm going to write my first fiction novel this year. And I'm going to film it. And we're going to release one video each week. And if you keep up with Stilla's word count, by the end of 2017, you'll have... Your choices have clearly led you here, as have mine. I will give you a new choice. All right, Temper Centers, we're back from vacation. Yay! And so now we're done with editing for the year. We are done. Now we're going to move into how to actually publish your book. And we're going to make the biggest decision. You can say stuff. You don't have to just hand. No, it's fine. You don't have to do American Sign Language the whole I'm time. Cool. You can actually say stuff. Okay. <laughs> so now we're going to make the biggest decision you have to make for this last part of the year. Whether to go traditional publishing or self-publishing. And to help us make that decision is another writer from our writers group, Rick Little Dog Barnes. So Rick used to be a member of our writers group. Um, I guess he's still are. The group is Who's when we actually do yeah, the writers yeah, group. So Rick, Rick was a member of our, our writers group, and he's actually have, has written uh, his own YA fantasy novel called Portal. Yes. Which is a mix between Narnia and Harry Potter. Sort of. <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> sure. And Lord of the Rings. Woo! Okay. Yeah, we'll go with that too. Yeah. Young adult fantasy novel, young kids, each with their own issues. Uh, end up in a fantasy world where they're captured by orcs and find they have to work together. And there's a little bit of a moral to the story because uh, two of the kids are, are bullies and the other ones are the ones being bullied and they end up having to work together. Okay, very cool. Very so cool. he's currently shopping that around. Yes, I am. Well, the reason we asked Rick here is because I'm definitely for self-publishing, but Rick's taking the traditional publishing route, yes. whereas Still is taking just the versus route. So why do you have to choose between one of these two right now, still a web. It's time to decide which way you're going to go because now's when you're going to have to start prepping for doing whatever it is you need to do on whichever of these two paths you choose. You're going to have to make a lot of decisions in these coming two months. Yeah. About the cover, about the blurb, about how you're going to market it. And depending on which path you choose, those decisions will be wildly different. Our advice to you, if you self-publish a cover, is very different than if you traditionally go traditional publish for a cover. Even your editing is going to change depending on traditional or self-publishing. I definitely chose self-publishing for my two books, but Rick, why are you looking at traditional publishing for Portal? Tra traditional publishing uh, gives you more uh, distribution. Your book will show up in bookshops where most self-publishing, depending on which way you end up going, is mostly e-publishing, so you don't end up with physical yeah. copies of the book. Yeah, you'll never, you'll never end up in a bookshop yeah. instead of self-publishing. Exactly. Um, it also, a traditional publisher will do the marketing for you, where self-publishing you have to do the marketing yourself. They also offer editing. Yes. Yeah. So you don't make as much, but... Which way? With the traditional. You make more of the, uh, per book, going to self-publishing. Oh, yeah. But... All right. Yeah, a lot less responsibility. Involved. So, you can't talk about, so, we'll talk about both in this episode, but you can't talk about traditional publishing without talking about the big five. Five. Who are the big five still at Tiberius Web? The largest publisher of consumer books would be Penguin Random House. Now, all of these big five, they own a ton of smaller publishing groups and then smaller publishing houses underneath that. It's very confusing. I will have a link for you in the, like, yeah, in the description down below. Penguin Random House, according to current estimates, owns 37% of the consumer book market. So they own the biggest chunk of the consumer book market. Number two is Harper Collins, with a total of 17.5% of the consumer book market. And what are they like? They have a lot of they have a bunch of groups, too, and a bunch of more imprints, a mm. ton of imprints. They sound very bespoke. You didn't do any research about what they... No, because they don't <coughs> specialize in anything. That's just it. They don't do that anymore. Because what they did is they went and they just bought up all the small houses that did specialize. So they all do romance, they all do sci-fi, yeah. they all do fantasy, they all do lit, they all do kids, okay. they all do adult. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, looking at the web pages, it was actually kind of interesting to see the, how similar all the titles were. All the, even the covers from every book probably should look yeah. the same. Number three is Simon and Schuster. We've all heard that name before. Mm -hmm. They have eleven point seven percent of the consumer book market. Next, Hatchet. S say that. Hatchet. 
H A C H E T T E. Like an axe. Oh sort shit! Of. Oh shit! What is Hatchet known for, Kitty? They're actually a big international book publisher, but they only have hold nine percent of the consumer books. They tend to actually focus more on non-consumer books. A lot of um, European school books and things like that. Uh, a lot like Scholastic and things like that. But they do have a small international consumer book thing, but they don't own as many imprints. Yeah, again, looking at their webpage... But if you're international, they're one of the ones to look at. But if you're yeah. in the English-speaking world, one of the big three. Last but not least, we have Macmillan, with 5% of the consumer book market share. It's a small one, but it's still bigger than most of the smaller, smallest. So those are the five traditional houses. Mm -hmm. So the problem I see with traditional is, if you want to get published, you have to go through one of those five. They're the gatekeepers. Rick Barnes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have right. to replace him with a puppet. Okay, we're going to replace him with a puppet too. <laughs> traditional market, the, the paperback market, is dominated by these five. To, to get your books on a shelf in Barnes Noble, you're pretty much going to have to go through these five. Cool, 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 cool. What Scholastic books fall under? Scholastic is its own. Well, Scholastic it's is not, not like, one of the big five. It's, it's not, not owned by them. Fives. Nope, it's one of the big ten. Yeah. There was another list that had a bunch, but Scholastic okay. was is its own. It's like Bain, where it's it, it's not owned by anything else. Scholastic is actually number six. Six, yeah. there you go. I was gonna say I knew it was in the ten. There we go. Yeah, Disney Publishing is moving up, but yeah. everything else is just unknown. Um, so the big five are generally where you're gonna find adult stuff. That's not what I meant. You're gonna find. <laughs> <laughs> because of these gatekeepers, they get hundreds and hundreds of submissions every single day. A big slush pile pops in. If you really want to get in the door of one of these. You have to go through a literary, a literary, literary. agent. A liter literally a literary agent. A literary agent. I have no yeah. experience with this, but Rick Barnes might. Yes, I do. Expound. So, there's a website that I found, and you could add the link to the correct We're website. just going to put Pornhub down here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's the, uh, the literary agent's wish list. What can an agent do for you? Like, instead of just, instead of just going to a traditional com and submitting my manuscript, what does the agent do for you? The agents are the ones who are the one, they work with the uh, publishers to sell your book and they will set the deal up and they're basically like a, um, a recruiter, yeah. I guess is the best way to look at it. Yeah. And they take like, you know, 10% of the, <coughs> the whatever the profit, but the point is if you convince the agent you're good, they can convince one of the big five publishing houses you're good. You have a much higher chance of that than going to the slush pile. Right. Some of them don't even have slush piles anymore. Kitty, what is a slush pile? A slush pile is the manuscript pile that unsolicited manuscripts go into. And they have a slush reader that reads through them, and it is huge. And they don't spend much time on it. So you've got like two pages to maybe catch the slush reader's attention, and then it gets chucked. Yeah. All right, when you're submitting to a literary agent, a lot of them on their websites will say specifically what they're looking for. And it usually comes down to three paragraphs. First is you have to explain in the first paragraph what drew you to that agent. Uh, why did you pick them over anybody else? Uh, second would be a one paragraph synopsis of your book. And that's it. You have one paragraph to sell it and make it sound unique and pitch it why your book stands out and why would they want to publish it. Then the third is a, a, a paragraph explaining who you are, if you have any publishing history, uh, blogs, self-published articles and magazines anything that's where you pitch yourself yeah and this is where submitting to both sides is where you get those um those rules about must be on eight and a half by eleven typewritten script must be in this font <coughs> must be double-sided you know they're very strict kind right. of rules right because they their agents also get like tens of submissions yes. a day and they just they just chuck out anything that's on pink paper anything that's on the wrong font or wrong size they chuck it out they want, if you're a fi uh, horror agent, you just want horror, the best horror books, you're, you're looking for that. Some of them will ask for your first four, three or four chapters. Some will ask for the first ten pages. Um, and one, like, one that I've submitted to so far actually asked for a one-page um, synopsis of the entire book with spoilers. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. So you have to give the entire plot, explain who the characters are, from start to finish, what happens in your book, scene by scene, and you have to get it on one one single page. Yeah, yeah. And if you're going to get really into this, if you're going to go traditional publishing, you need an agent to get you in that door to get you past those gatekeepers. 
Yeah, and the the agents typically weed out anything that's garbage. So when they're dealing with the the publishers, at that point the publisher realizes that they've already looked at the book and you know they don't want to have to sit and read every single book, which is why they go through all this to make sure the books that they do sit down and read are going to be semi-decent quality. So let me ask you this, do you need the book finished before you go to an agent, or do you just need the first not, few chapters? Not necessarily, but it's recommended that you do have it finished. Most will want to ask, you know, if they if you get through this and they ask for your entire book, they're not going to want to wait two or three months for you to finish <laughs> your book, so yeah. it's best to have the book ready and, and good to go. So, how many times have you been rejected so far? So far, only six. Is that from agents or from house publishing houses? From agents. I haven't okay. gotten past an agent yet. Um, I've they, they recommend submitting to about 20 to 30 agents a week. What? I've been, I've been submitting, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've been submitting to one or two a week because I work full time and I don't have time to really research all the agents. And I've been trying to pick agents that have worked with books similar to what I've written. Chicken Soup for the Soul was rejected 140 times before selling 125 million copies. Mm -hmm. um, Louis L'Amour, famous Western author, was rejected 200 times before Bantam took a chance on him. He's now the best-selling author ever. He's now their best-selling author ever with 330 million in sales. Wow. Yeah, I saw that site, but it was hard to read. Mm -hmm. um, Gone with the Wind was rejected 38 times. Blah, blah, blah. Gertrude Stein published or submitted poems for 22 years before having one published. Yep, I saw that one. Anne Frank was Diary of a Young Girl was rejected 15 times. Peter Rabbit was rejected. Peter Rabbit had to be self-published. Beatrix yeah. Potter had to self-publish it. She couldn't get it self-published. Carrie, Stephen King's first book, was rejected 30 times before it was published. Carrie, people. Carrie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Peter Zen Rabbit. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance was rejected 121 times before it was published. And apparently people love that book. I know nothing about it. Um, a, wrinkle a Wrinkle in Time. Yeah, a Wrinkle in Time was rejected 26 times. Yeah. Animal Farm was... Oh, here we go. Freaking... Dune by Frank Hebert was rejected 23 times before it was published. Jeez. Dune. Arrakis. Desert Planet. Angela Christie had to wait four years before getting published. Agatha Christie. Agatha Christie. Agatha Christie. James Joyce was rejected 22 times before he was first published. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone was rejected 12 times, and J.K. Rollins was told not to quit her day job. And then, of course, Portal. Six times so far. Are you keeping each rejection letter? Yes, I am. Yeah. So, yes, I am. I, I, this is the question I was going to ask earlier. Have they been form rejection letters, or have you gotten actually personalized rejection? I believe they've all been form. Okay. They sound pretty form. But when you get the personal one, you start getting <coughs> excited. Then you're moving yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're moving, moving up. up. Uh, well, you're on the topic of rejection. A funny story. Uh, director Kevin Smith. Clerks. Clerks, yeah. yes. Uh, has a letter hanging above his computer that he, he, to this day, still has there, basically telling him he's not going to mount to anything. <laughs> Kevin yeah. Smith. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, so Stephen King in his book talks about how he, when he was a kid he used to get rejection letters and he used to nail them to his wall. Then he had to replace it with a bolt because it got too heavy to, for the nail to hold. Then he replaced it with a, a railroad spike because it got too, all the rejection letters got too heavy for the bolt to hold. Yeah. So you're going to get rejected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of those authors actually has like a mailbag full of rejections that she got. Yeah. It's ridiculous. I so. actually prefer rejections over not hearing back anything because oh, yeah. that at least says to me they took the time to at least look at your submission yeah. and you're hearing something back one way or the other. When they receive certain types of books, they'll throw them out. Hmm. Zombies. Don't write about zombies if you're going to traditionally publish because they just don't even read them. They'll throw them out. Hmm. Uh, another one they pointed out, they said, you know, a lot. unfortunately, you'd think it, it's a unique idea. Second coming of Jesus. They throw them out. And <laughs> even though there aren't a lot of those books being published, there's a lot of those type books being submitted. Interesting. Uh, Hitler returning. You know, <laughs> another, another one they'll toss out. That's a weird one. Yeah. Huh. Unfortunately, I, or fortunately, whatever you, however you look at it, apparently people are writing that. 
A lot of, and they all think they're unique. Uh, maybe. I mean, well, because I, there's not much out there. Like, oh, here's a market that doesn't look like it's being serviced. Let's service it. Well, and the publishers are like, nope. And there goes half the people watching this show who just wrote one of those three things, and they're throwing yep. their computer across the room. All, all our, upset. That's now. what self-publishing is for. Our four, our fourteen <laughs> fans who are writing Hitler returning uh, e-books are to just fight Nazis through, yeah, through yeah, through my to, right to fight zombies, rather. Yeah. yeah. This Hitler. is right. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> This is one of the reasons I didn't do so, or I didn't do traditional publishing. Is we were on a panel that we were, we were moderating this panel at a, at, a, at a science fiction convention, and there was this guy Saladin Ahmed who showed up, and he was one of the authors on the panel. Yeah. He had been nominated for the John W. Campbell Award for best science fiction writer, best new science fiction writer. He'd been nominated for a Nebula, nominated nominated for a Hugo Award. He won the Locus Award for like best new science fiction book. And while we were at the convention. On his blog, there was a plea that he needed help from his readers to buy him new glasses because he wasn't making enough money from selling his traditionally published book mm -hmm. to, to get glasses <clears throat> to be able to read and write to do publishing and travel to conventions and stuff. Yeah. And if you actually look at it, there's, we'll link an article in the description, most traditionally published authors still make less than minimum wage. Yes. And so... You make it rich. Yeah, yeah, if the, um... Unless you're Stephen King, you're not gonna yeah. be... Oh, hold on. Uh... Ooh. Why am I on the thing by myself? Okay, here, come here. Um, okay, so, but if you look at, um, earnings to rank in, in traditional publishing, it looks like this. Right, yeah. yeah. So, Stephen <clears throat> King, you know, and J.K. Rowling are making millions and millions of dollars, but the vast majority of people are down here making nothing. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's that's like the Saladin Ahmed story, is that he was a great author, nominated for all these awards, but you still don't make as much as Stephen King. There's just not, the money's not there. Yeah, and, and I know plenty of traditionally published authors who work full-time jobs. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of, uh, one I worked with was a technical writer, and he worked for a company for his full-time job, but you know, he had several books published, uh, novels, kids' books, you know, he had a decent catalog under his name, and his big, uh, big income had to be a full-time job because he wasn't going to be able to support himself on the traditional published income. Yeah, when, when Infinity Squad <clears throat> 1 came out, and it was doing pretty well, and it was getting good reviews, I sat down one time and I was like, how many books do I have to sell to support myself as an author? And I was like, there's no way this math works. I'd have to multiply my sales by a thousand to even be you know, financially stable. It, just, it wasn't there, so I kept my day job, and I wrote on the side, mm -hmm. as a self-publishing person, which we'll now go to now. Oh, and that brings us to our sponsor for this week, because we got to pay our bills too. So this week we're sponsored by Bespoke. It don't mean fancy. If someone makes you a bespoke pair of shoes, are they fancy shoes, or are they shoes made just for you? They might be both. <laughs> Bespoke. It doesn't mean fancy. Just for you. Yeah. Fancy, fancy you. So now we've switched everything up. We're going to talk about self-publishing. This is having no gatekeeper. This is choosing a, a website, typically online, and uploading your book, designing the cover, yourself or paying someone and just putting it out there yourself. So when you talk about self-publishing, you have to talk about the big one. Amazon. Amazon is 80% of the ebook market. All by itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that even comes close. Not the traditional five, nothing even barnesnoble.com, nothing comes close. If you're going to self-publish, you're going to put it on Amazon. So yeah, that's what I love about self-publishing <coughs> is that you're in control. Mm -hmm. If you want to write a zombie erotic book, you write it, right? <laughs> Nobody reads it. Oh well. Yeah, it doesn't matter. But y you can control your word count. You can control your weird uh, chapter breaks. You can control your subject mm -hmm. matter. So that's why I love self-publishing. So in self-publishing, we're talking about the big one, Amazon. I'm also fond of Smashwords. When I was publishing Infinity Squad, Smashwords was the only place to format your book. In a, you could upload a book. It would format automatically. So I'm still partial to Smashwords. Uh, so I list my you book You use on Smashwords too submit to Amazon. Yeah, I, I have my book on sale for both, and even though it sold some on Smashwords, 
It's yeah, it's like ten percent Smashwords, eighty percent Amazon, and five percent like BarnesandNoble.com. Uh, -huh. uh, Smashwords I really love because Smashwords every year publishes the the the, the owner of Smashwords, Mark Coker, publishes what worked on Smashwords that year and what didn't work. And he has all these graphs and charts that are really good for uh, independent authors to analyze. We'll link. Yeah, well, that's how I set my prices because he figured out what the best price for books are, which is like two ninety nine, three ninety nine. Yep. Um, but the category, what category do you guys think sells the most on Smashwords.com? Romance. By how much? Fifty percent. Romance is seventy seven percent of the category. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So. Uh, romance is seventy-seven percent of what sells on Amazon. It's the porn hub for women. It's nine of the top ten bestsellers are in romance. Seventy-eight percent of the top fifty. Seventy-five percent of the top hundred. And what Mark Coker thinks from twenty sixteen, romance authors why it dominates. They're the most professional, sophisticated, experimental, and organized, and they have amazing relationships with readers. Mm -hmm. So, if you, uh, some of you guys may have heard of Jim Butcher award-winning author Jim Butcher, his wife writes romance. Yeah, well, his ex-wife. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, they got divorced a few years really? ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he marries a male. Jim Butcher is a very well-known science fiction author. He writes a Dresden series. We used to go to conventions. It was mobbed. Everyone would want to see Jim Butcher, right? His wife writes romance. His wife outsells him like three to one. Uh, Completely. Yeah, because, her, and, and I've, I've never heard of her name. I, didn't, I don't know who Shannon Butcher is, but... You don't read romance. But she's not a household name. Yeah. But she outsells them three to one because romance is a category where people just burn through books. So the self-publishing landscape is you have to design your own cover, you have to edit your own book, you have to format it, you have to upload it, you have to go promote it, uh, and then you get the bigger cut. Self-publishing, I get 70% of everything Amazon sells. Traditional, you'd get like what? 15, 20? 15 to 20, I would guess. Yeah, yeah, 10, yeah. To, 10 to 20, depending on how good your agent is and mm -hmm. what your category is and all that good stuff, yeah. yeah. So Hugh Howley, the most successful self-publishing author of all time, he wrote the Wool series, and he publishes every year an author's earning report. And the reason self-published authors make more than traditional is because of that 70-30 split. Mm -hmm. If you sell a thousand copies of traditional, the publishing house makes the money. If you sell a thousand copies of self-publishing, you make the money. The other point with self-publishing is you control how long the book's in circulation, where traditional <laughs> publishing you usually get one print, and if you sell well, maybe they'll continue printing, but if you don't, that's it. You have one print, and your book is done. And now they have the rights to it, and depending on your contract, but they can control and make it go into oblivion at that point. Yeah. The other good thing about self-publishing is you have the control over how fast you publish your stuff. You decide how fast you write, when it's ready to go out, so you can get a huge catalog of written works much faster through self-publishing than you can through traditional publishing. You can finish a series because you actually want to finish it, even if the sales are starting to dip at the end of your series, whereas a publishing company can just cut it off and say, eh, it's not doing well enough, or we don't want that book anymore. Yeah. And then your series is dead, and you've only got two out of four books printed. Yeah. So. Yeah. In, in Fifty Squad, I published it about five years ago, I think. Um, all told, I've made like about a thousand five hundred dollars, two thousand dollars, you know, with it. I made the first one free, and that led to a lot of downloads of the second one. I could control that sort of stuff, but I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna make thirty thousand dollars, you know, from self publishing. I'm not gonna make a hundred thousand dollars. I'm not gonna quit my day job, but I'm also not a Saudi Namid. So we have a list of the self published authors who hit the jackpot. Woo! Amanda Hawking, she's well known in the YA area. She actually wrote a bunch of books, self-published them, and then the publisher came to her to pick up, pick her up as one of their authors. That's the dream goal. It never that, happens. That's my goal. It'll never happen. It never that's happens. That's what I'm hoping for. You self-publish so hard, traditional publishers knocked on your door. Mm -hmm. You'd think she'd use the influence from her brother. Ah. <laughs> E.L. James, of course, Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, Lisa Genova, who did Still Alice. Her stuff was rejected. She's actually a neuroscientist about Alzheimer's. And she went ahead and self-published and then was picked up by a publisher. Um, Hugh Howey, which Shvam already talked about, again picked up by a publisher. Best-selling self-published author of all time, Hugh Howey. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a couple of romance authors who are doing extremely well on self-publishing. They have not been picked up. Barbara Hugh Howey Feithley. was the one who wrote Wall. Yeah, yes, yeah, she, okay. he wrote Wall, yeah. Barbara Freethy and... Bella Andre are the best two best-selling romance self-published authors on Amazon. And 
yeah, it can be done. I mean, these people are, you know, they've sold millions of copies of their book at this point. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands of millions of copies. Of but books. again, you got to ask yourself, like, what's the point of your writing? Like, is it to replace your day job, or is it to let other people see this cool thing, this cool idea you had in your head? And if it's the latter, you know, I, I believe in self-publishing. It lets you get your word out there. Mm -hmm. If people are looking for that, mil you know, military sci-fi, cloning, or whatever, they find my book, they read it, it's free on Amazon. Please silence all cell phones before. <laughs> before taping. Taping. All right. So wrapping everything up, when you're when you're choosing between self-publishing and traditional, the pros of self-publishing are control. You control everything, and with Amazon and Smashwords, they make it very easy for you to get your stuff out there. The pros of traditional are you don't have to do the marketing, and you have a wider distribution of your book in bookstores and places like that. Yeah, the potential to hit it big is exactly, there in traditional. Yes. Well, there is a potential, as we pointed out, smaller, yeah. but there is still a potential po potential in self-publishing. Okay. Self-publishing, you have to do everything yourself. Mm -hmm. In traditional, if you really, really don't want to do some of this stuff yourself, like marketing, editing, things like that, traditional might be more your cup of tea. But it's going to be a lot harder to break into. Yeah. To that point, you also do still need some editing before you even submit it. Yeah, you because should do some editing. If it's in really bad shape, they'll toss it right out. So, your homework this week is to choose between how you're going to publish your book for next week, because then we're going to start talking about covers and blurbs and marketing. So, read the links we give. There will be a lot this week. Yeah. Do your homework and choose between, because, oh, 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 oh. Oh, 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 oh. Put this part ahead of us, future us. Traditional people don't like it if you self-hollow first and then try to sell them the, the, the book to the traditional. I've heard that's not necessarily true. It's not anymore. anymore. No. Not okay. anymore. They've, they've broken that. Yeah, they've yeah. broken that down. Now it's, it's, it's better if you're like, hey, you know, when you're shopping for agents, hey, I've had, you know, 100,000 well, not if you get that far, but like I've had 5,000 people download my book in the last four months. Yeah, if you can show success and prove that you're selling, this is sellable. They're more, they're willing, more willing to take to a chance on oh. you. <laughs> I don't know. I, I can help you with that work out. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> abort, 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 abort. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. <laughs>